If you have your Bible tonight, I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, and we come to chapter 4. Chapter 4 is often known for um, the second coming of the Lord, the time when he appears, the trumpet sounds, and the dead in Christ rise. But not a lot of people talk about the beginning of chapter 4. And the beginning of chapter four speaks to every generation, every age, because it speaks about moral purity and what we are called to be in Christ. And may we hear the word of the Lord, and I just wanna read a few verses, and I want you to leave your Bible open tonight. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk, and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Now let me stop there for a moment because I want you to understand, I keep saying this, every time that we look at this passage, Paul spent three weeks in Thessalonica. It was only three weeks that he had to, to build this church. In this statement, he refers to the things that he told them. When he wanted to go back to Thessalonica, this is what he said, I was hindered. I was hindered by the enemy. I was unable to get back to you. And he instead sent Timothy to Thessalonica to check on them. Did he still have a church in Thessalonica? Were there still people who loved God, who were serving the Lord? And when Timothy got back, he reported to Paul, and part of this letter is a response to what Timothy had said to him. All of us know that if you're writing a letter, you, you're conveying information. We don't write letters anymore. Uh, we, we speak by email, by text, whatever the case may be. And in a lot of cases, companies have banned uh, the use of email as correction because people have a tendency to be really bold on email. And they say things that you just don't know what they mean by it, or, or they're very difficult to deal with. And so a lot of companies have just said, hey, communicate in a way that people feel you like them or you wanna be around them. And so after this time where Timothy reports and Paul is writing back, we get into the, to the meat of what he's about to say and I want you to look in verse three and uh, I will read through verse eight and then we're gonna look at that scripture. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Father, I pray tonight that you would speak to every heart in this room. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for what you're going to say tonight. And I pray, God, that we would be obedient to the word of God. Thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. When Paul is writing, he is like an officer who is passing a command from a commanding officer. He is someone who is passing down information that is not his idea, it's God's idea. It's what the Lord has spoken. And so when we look tonight at the areas that he speaks to us about, the first is sexual purity in our life. You have to understand that Thessalonica was in, was in Greece and there were no boundaries in this area. They did not serve God. They did not understand anything about God. They had false religions, and some of the religions and the temples of that day, prostitution was a part of the religion. And so people would pay to 
have sex with a prostitute and somehow feel like that was going to bring a blessing upon their life. When we think about it, it was as if the women of a marriage were called to be chaste and pure and the men could pretty well do what they wanted to do. We know that that is not God's plan for us. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse four, you're gonna see it on the screen in just a second. Hebrews 13, verse four, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So what does he say to us? He's saying that sex outside of marriage or sex before marriage will be judged by God, that God will be the judge. So in verses three through eight, it's God's will that all of us be holy, be separate. In 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse 30, the scripture says this to us, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So I want to talk to you for a moment about what it means to be holy. How in the world are we going to be holy? You say, Pastor, listen, I, that's just not me. That's not who I am. And I want to say to you, if you are saved tonight, if you're a born-again believer tonight, that positionally you are holy. God set you apart at salvation. And that's what being holy or being sanctified means. It means to be set apart. So what happens at salvation, it happens positionally in the heavens. When you're saved, your sin debt is wiped out. And the Lord looks at you, not seeing everything in your past, but seeing your sin covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid your sin debt. That's what happens to us. So, so whether you've been righteous for most of your life or righteous for a day, it doesn't really matter, does it? If you're saved, you're saved. Positionally, you're righteous. But the practical part of salvation doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in a moment. You have to learn how uh, to be what you need to be with the Holy Spirit's help. So when we think about it, it doesn't mean, when we talk about grace, it doesn't mean that God has lowered any standard in our life. Do you remember the woman that was caught in adultery and they only brought her to Jesus. They didn't bring the man. It was just her. And, and Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground. We have no idea what he wrote. We have no idea what, what the message was on the ground. But whatever it was, he made the statement that he that is without sin may cast the first stone. And they all disappear. They all go. There, there's no one left. Uh, to throw a stone at her. And then Jesus makes a statement. He said, neither do I condemn you. Now that's grace, isn't it? Yes. I mean, neither do I condemn you, but we don't quote the second part of what he said. Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. In other words, you are now called to be holy and to be righteous. So when we think about what happens in our life, and we're living in a day where, where we're, we're a lot like Greece. We're a lot like that time period. And people think, well, you know what? What are, what are the consequences if I don't obey God in this area of my life? And I wanna submit to you that all you have to do is look back through the scriptures and see what the consequences were. The greatest failure perhaps in David's life was his sexual sin with Bathsheba. We know the story. All the men are out to war. David's on the rooftop and he looks in the distance and he sees a beautiful woman who's taking a bath apparently on, on the rooftop and he has a desire for her. And she's married and he brings her to his house and he sleeps with her and the one thing that would prove he's guilty happens. She becomes pregnant. And so we all know what he does. He calls her husband home and he uh, tries to get him to, to visit the house and to be with his wife. And the man says, no, I, I can't do that when all the other men are on the battlefield. And David, because he refuses to sleep with his wife, this man, 
sends him to the front of the line, has him killed. That's just the beginning of what happens in David's life. Later, his son Absalom would rebel and it would be Bathsheba's grandfather who is advising Absalom of what he needs to do. It just keeps biting him and it just keeps coming outside of him. And so I wanna tell you tonight, that's the danger. And nobody is saying that in our culture. And to a generation of young people who are being told that it really doesn't matter, we need as the church to speak to that generation and say there are consequences to stepping outside the boundaries of sex as God ordained it. And so when we think about it, we need to think about it this way. And I think all of us will, will, will understand this. When you look at a river, there are boundaries for that river. But when a flood comes and that river goes outside of its boundaries, there's damage that occurs. And it occurs in an incredible way. We've just lived through in the mountains of Western North Carolina what it is like when a river cannot stay in its boundaries. And I wanna tell you that the Gentiles of that day did not know or pretended not to know or neglect the knowledge that they have. Acting like God can be disregarded. And we have people today who live in that, in that instance. They go to church every week across America and yet they're living in a way as if God is not paying attention to how they live or what they do. I'm not gonna get many amens tonight. That's all right. You'll be here longer if I have to stop and say amen myself all the time. Here's um, Here's what we need to see, and I want you to see tonight what the scripture says. It says to us that this is an offense against another person. Verse six, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of such. So here's what God says. He says to be, to be involved sexually is an offense to someone else. And you might say, well, I, I get that if, if someone's married and you're sleeping with their wife, that that would be an offense to, a, to another brother. But I wanna tell you that I think scripture says it's an offense the other way as well. If you're involved with someone who's not married and, and you take their virginity that was meant to be for the person that they were going to marry, you have defrauded that person. And so tonight, when we start thinking about what God is telling us, it's not that God is against sex, he's for sex. God created it. So we don't think of God in heaven as someone who's trying to punish us. He's someone who knows that what he created is best fulfilled in a marriage relationship. That God wants us to find a person that we're going to commit to and live the rest of our life with or as long as we have on this earth. Now, I'm not here throwing stones tonight because I know some of you have gone through divorce in your life and you may have had someone who was unfaithful to you and, and uh, did not uh, align themselves with the word of God or maybe it was before you really knew God and your life was not aligning with the word of God. But here's what I want you to know. It is offensive to other people. It's offensive to the person that you're defrauding. It is a selfish sin. Sexual sin is a selfish sin because it's all about gratifying self. And when someone is pressuring you to have sex outside of marriage or before marriage, they're in a place where they're being selfish. They're not looking to honor God or honor you. They're being selfish. Here's the second thing I want you to see. The sexual sin is punished by God. He is the one who will deal with the matter. The Bible says, as you defraud, defraud your brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness. So we are told that God will punish us when we are outside of the boundaries in this area. And we either will cooperate with the Holy Spirit in this area, and sometimes we will, if we're not careful, we're working with God in one area of our life and we're shutting him down in another area of our life. 
And there's not a person in this room, I don't believe, that doesn't understand that. You can be really, really in tune with God in one area of your life and really fall off the wagon in another area of your life. You can say, you know what, I'm, I'm doing this right, but in this area that you never talk about, you're faltering and you're failing. And so tonight, I, I wanna say to you that we are called to, to live our lives as people who are obedient to the Lord. So if we're, if we're going down this path tonight, and we're saying, okay, God's calling us to purity. And God's calling us to abstain from this because this is not what he wants in our life. He wants us to be pure and to be holy. Somebody said, well, that's just not who I am. Well, it is if you belong to God. If you belong to God, it's not just you, it's the Holy Spirit in you who helps you. So if you're struggling in this area of your life, you, you set up boundaries in your life. You put up some walls so that, so that you, can, um, you can keep yourself pure. One of the things that we say to the pastors is this, we never want you alone with another woman that's not your wife. We don't want you going out to eat with someone alone that's, that's not your spouse. We don't want you riding in a car with someone who's not your spouse. Even if everything is perfectly innocent, you open the door for somebody to criticize you or somebody to make a statement about you. Because here's what we know. All of us have to put some boundaries in our life. All of us have to be smart in this area of our life. Several years ago when I was preaching a series on this, I, I used to make the statement that every relationship may appear to start innocent. And sometimes people have relationships with people they work with or people they're around a good bit and, and, and people will, uh, will find themselves in a, in a situation where maybe their home life is not great and they're not getting along with the person that they're married to and they go to work and, and, and somehow they begin to share the personal side of their life and, you know, we're having problems at home and, and, and someone will come along. They always come along with a kind word and say, I don't, I don't know how anybody couldn't get along with you. You're just the nicest person I know. And those relationships and those statements begin to escalate and, uh, and sooner or later, they become more, you look nice today. And, and they began to deepen in the context. And I used to say from the pulpit, they're lying to you. You're not that good. You're not that nice. You don't even look that good today. They're lying to you. Because I want you to understand, a lot of people have a reason for what they're doing. And they're taking you down a journey, a journey where you're becoming emotionally attached to somebody when you're battling through a difficulty in your marriage or a difficulty in that time. But remember, God is calling us to be pure and God is calling us to be holy. And God is not trying to deprive us of anything. He's trying to help us understand that what the devil makes look good and appealing is not really good for you. And it's not the best for you. And it's not what God wants for you. And so when Paul speaks to the, this church in Thessalonica, he's telling them, you know what? This may be hard, but you're not gonna live like everybody else. You're different. God has done a work in your life. God has redeemed you and he's saved you and he's ministered to you in a powerful way. And I wanna tell you tonight, uh, that we're no different than ancient Greece. We live in a, in a sexualized time. And all you have to do is, is turn on your television, you understand it, or maybe the modern day problem is in my pocket tonight. It's in, it's in this phone that, well, it's not in that picture right there. That's the prize right there. But it is in the fact that whether you're on Facebook, Twitter, whatever you're on, you constantly will see something that is pushing you in a direction that is ungodly and unwholesome. And I wanna tell you tonight, we are called to guard ourselves. We're called to understand that we have a helper who will keep us pure. It is the Holy Spirit of God. And we can't be in a situation that would bring harm or damage to our relationship. Somebody say amen. amen. So then he goes to the, the next verse, verse nine. 
But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business. And we, how many of you have told people to mind your own business and you didn't know you were quoting scripture when you were doing it? <laughs> and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. I want to talk to you about two things, he says, and I'm going to end tonight. The first thing he talks to us about is brotherly love. And in the church, we use this term, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Some of you may not use that term or you may not like that term or whatever the case may be. You say, where's that come from? Well, you have to understand that we are brothers and sisters because we all have the same daddy. If you are born again, you have a heavenly father, an Abba father. All of us that are born again have an Abba father. We have the same father. Man, we look a lot different to have the same daddy. But we don't look different on the inside if we're truly born again. So here's what he's saying to us. If, if, if we really are born again and have the same daddy, we're gonna love one another. That's going to be the characteristic of love. When Jesus prayed his last prayer in John 17, one of the things he prayed about was unity. He prayed that everybody he prayed for you. He prayed for people who would come after him and, and, and after uh, his disciples, and that's us. And he prayed that we would be united and in essence that we would love everybody because he said, this is the mark of discipleship that you have love one for another. All men will know that you're my disciple if you love one another. So his remark to the church is this, let brotherly love increase or continue. And then he comes to a place where it seems like that he's a little bit fed up, doesn't it? Mind your own business. What's he saying? In the latter part of this chapter, and we'll look at it the next time we meet, he's gonna talk about the return of the Lord. When you read First and Second Thessalonians, you know that there was some false teaching. Paul is there for three weeks and he tells them the Lord is coming back. When? It's apparent that some of them believed it, it was gonna be like in a day or so. It was gonna really be soon. We can't fault them because Paul only had three weeks with them. If you knew the Lord was coming back in a couple of days, what would you do? you probably quit your job. I'm just gonna rest up for a couple of days. That's exactly what appeared to be happening. But then the Lord hasn't come back in a couple of days and you've quit your job and you have a tendency if you don't have purpose in life to get in somebody else's purpose. You have a tendency if you've got too much time on your hands to, to deal with other people's problems and that's where Paul comes along and says, mind your own business. Mind your own business. Work with your hands as we commanded you that you may walk properly to those who are outside and that you lack nothing. In other words, Paul is saying to some in the church, go back to work, get a job, do something productive with your life so that you provide for your family and be the blessing that you should be and stay out of everybody else's business. Do what you're supposed to do. Amen. You say, this is an odd, odd group of things to clump together. I mean, he's talking about, uh, about sexual purity and he's talking about not defrauding your brother and he's laying the groundwork there and then all of a sudden he says, love each other. Brothers and sisters, we all got the same daddy, love each other. And then he goes and says, some of you need to go back to work. Some of you need to keep your job. Some of you need to stay out of everybody's business. And you need to be faithful to what God's called you to do. 
And you say, well, who would put those three things together? You would do it if you're responding to what Timothy brought back to you. You're responding because Timothy said, Paul, there's some people in the church that in those three weeks, they just didn't get it. They're living sexually like the Gentiles are. And they're living like the world's living. They, they don't understand that there's a purity, a difference that comes when you know God in your life. You can't live like everybody else. You can't operate in that realm like everybody else. They don't understand God's gonna judge you for that. God's gonna punish you for that. They don't understand that, that love is what makes us who we are in the church. They don't understand that you're not coming back perhaps tomorrow. You could be, but we're to stay faithful to what you've called us to do until that time. And we're to just do what we need to do and stay out of everybody else's business. I know none of you have that problem and I don't even know why I'm saying that tonight except it's in the text. Except it's in the text. Heard a story and I'll, I'll end with this. Heard a story about a man who attended a church that was dying. And the pastor and the church board decided that they were going to change how the church was functioning. They were older, everybody in the church was gray-headed. And, uh, and they decided, we've got to make some decisions here to reach a younger generation. And I'll call the man Kevin, just, just to use a different name. And so one of the first things they decide to do is we're, we're gonna become a little more contemporary with our music and we're gonna sing songs that may reach the generation that we're ministering to and or trying to reach. And so they began to sing the songs and Kevin just went ballistic. So Kevin went to the pastor and he said to the pastor, I don't wanna sing these songs. I think the music's too loud. I, I, think, I think you're making a big mistake here. The music's just too loud. And the pastor said, well, Kevin, I, I want you to understand, look around, everybody in the room is old. If we don't begin to make some changes to reach the next generation, we're not gonna exist as a church before long. And he said, I don't care, the music is still too loud. So they kept going a few more Sundays and he went to all the leadership of the church, he went to every deacon in the church and he said, the music's too loud and something's gotta be done about it. Finally, the church leadership decided we got to do something about Kevin because he's sowing discord in the church and he's gone to everybody and he's tried to get everybody to side up and they're not siding up with him and he's angry. And so they went to him and they said, look, Kevin, you've got to stop this. You've got to stop this or we're going to have to do something to you. We'll have to take church disciplinary action against you. And Kevin said, the music's still too loud. Every attempt failed until one day a man walked in the church from OSHA and he said, we have received a complaint. And the complaint is that the music, the decibel level in this church is way too loud and I've been sent out to investigate. And at that moment, the pastor began to laugh out loud. And he said, would you wait a minute? I wanna get the rest of the staff in here to hear this. And he pulls all the staff in and, and he said, would you tell them one more time what you just told me? He said, we've had a complaint and we have come out to investigate. We've been told the decibel level of the music in this church is too loud. And they all started laughing because they knew that the person who had filed the complaint and sent the government out to inspect them was Kevin. Because Kevin was so caught up in his purpose and his will and what he wanted, they didn't care anything about the rest of the church. He didn't care if it died. He didn't care if it died. Now, I wanna be careful tonight because I'm gonna tell you, Matt, Bartlett may not always lead your favorite song on Sunday morning. Can I tell you something? He may not sing my favorite song on Sunday. 
You, you may not believe this. He doesn't even ask me if I like a song before he picks it out. What kind of a worship pastor do I have at this church that doesn't come and say, Pastor, do you like this song? <laughs> so let me tell you, let me tell you what happens in our life. If we're not careful, we get so self-centered and so tied up in ourself and our preferences that we lose sight of what may be the best interest of the church moving forward. Now, you say, Pastor, why do you say that? Because I think that applies to all of this. You can be so selfish that your desire sexually overrides the word of God and you want God's blessing on your life. And you say, God, I don't care what you say. I want to feel this desire in my life. You can be so caught up in who you are that you don't care about the preferences of others. That's the love that we have for one another. If you really love somebody, let me tell you something. When you're dating, the person you're trying to woo and to, uh, to date, you'll tell a lie. You'll say you love that restaurant because they want to go to that restaurant. You'll say you like that style of music because they like that style of music. You'll lie all the way through till you're married and then you'll say, I don't like any of that. <laughs> and then he says, hey, it's not about you. Mind your own business. It's not about you. So, so I want to tell you, everything that's in chapter four that he's been talking about tonight is really about the fact that you're not the person who gets to demand everything. Selfishness is a terrible disease. It is a terrible disease. And it controls how you see every single thing that goes on. We've been blessed in this church. We made so many changes in this church in 39 years. We've changed times. We've We've changed music. We've changed a lot of stuff. And people have been so gracious and, and kind as we've tried to move the church in, in different directions. And God has blessed us. But I want to tell you, it's been a joy to, to pastor people who understand that sometimes personal preference has to be on the back burner if we see God doing something great and the Lord blessing. And that becomes first. So I want to tell you tonight, you may say, well, man, this is who I am. This is how I live my life. And I'm telling you, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, you need to lay that down and crucify that tonight and say, God's word's got to be first in my life. Stand with me if you would. I want you to bow your heads. I want to pray with you tonight. I want you to hear me. I'm not, I'm not asking you to come forward. To, I'm not trying to identify I don't want you to raise your hand, but I believe there's probably some people in this room that are struggling in this area. And if I was preaching on a Sunday morning in this church uh, with a thousand plus attending, I'm sure that there's some people in this room that are battling this, this sexual selfishness and are not honoring God and honoring his word. You say, Pastor, you're direct tonight. That's what I'm supposed to be. Because that's what the scripture says. God wants purity in your life. You say, well, I'm involved with somebody. What am I supposed to do? I think you ought to go tell them, hey, I've given my heart and life to Jesus. And I realize that what I'm doing doesn't honor God. And he's done so much for me and saving me that I want my life to honor God. And I'm gonna tell you that my life's about to change. My life's about to change because this is what God says. This is what God says. And I want to pray over you tonight. I want to pray that you make the right decision tonight. And that God does something in your life to, to change forever. Father, I pray over this congregation tonight. I pray over those who are watching online. I pray, Lord, for those who are struggling in this area of sexual sin. God, that, that are being pressured Father, I pray tonight that you would just touch them. Help them to see, God, that this is not what's best. Help them to see, God, that you have ordained sex for marriage. And God, that you want to do a work in their life. And Lord, I pray that they would surrender their life to you. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, you would give them victory. You give them victory. 
God, for those who've been struggling, Lord, I, I pray tonight that they would just repent, that they would just ask your forgiveness. And they would say, Lord, I wanna honor you with my life. I want you to do something great in me. I want my life to count for something, to mean something. Father, thank you for what you're going to do in this church. And Lord, we just honor you and we just believe that you are able to meet every need. God bless this congregation and may the Holy Spirit do a great work in us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Have a great evening.